infrastructure, and that is that the regulatory uh, promoter and the sanctioning body are one and the same person in mixed martial arts. You know, everyone's been telling me not to speak up, and if you want to stay with the company, be quiet. And the promoter's the one matchmaking. If you want to move up that ladder, you better not piss them off. Yeah, I got the fight too, right? You can understand Absolutely. that. I'm working towards something here, all right? Everybody knows that. Sorry I had to do that to get the fight, but Dana here, he's selling wolf tickets. The UFC is selling you some wolf tickets. Uh, but the common theme is that they're all afraid. You take them outside the octagon and they're afraid. And the UFC is winning right now. Would you fight again under that contract? Mm, no. I took this fight because I want to like make sure that regardless I've been wrongly, wrongly treated, I can make my case of saying I've accomplished the eighth fight. You know, he's got it in his head that there's there's bigger opportunities outside the UFC. You're looking at, you're going to fight arguably the greatest fighter of all time. You'd be the highest paid heavyweight ever in UFC history. Or you think there's more money out there to fight somebody who isn't the greatest of all time, somebody who is a lesser opponent. There's been other guys that have come to us and said, you know, I don't, I don't want to compete at this level anymore. There is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Niccolo Machiavelli. That quote was about the Italian Renaissance era ruling class and their jockeying for power, yet it is somehow perfectly fitting in describing the never-ending struggle between fighters and promoters in mixed martial arts. At least it's seemingly never-ending. For many hopeful, there are three major efforts that could turn the tide for good. The holy trinity of change the antitrust lawsuits against the UFC, ongoing litigation nearing the trial phase, in which the promotion could end up owing its fighters more than the total it was sold for to Endeavor, in addition to the ending of contract provisions that have kept fighters well under the UFC's boot, the Ali Expansion Act into mixed martial arts, a bill that would see the federal government step in and overhaul the sport's business structures, not just tipping the power balance in the fighters' favor, but flipping the sport on its head altogether, a bill potentially on its way to the House of Representatives again as early as this year. Year. And lastly, a fighters association, the talent that makes this sport run banding together collectively to protect fighters from promoters, giving them for the first time ever a true seat at the table and a way to finally set the terms of contracts and the business of mixed martial arts fair through the power of collective bargaining. At least, that's often how these three efforts are depicted and discussed, these grand sweeping sport redefining actions, right on the cusp of succeeding and putting the UFC in their place once and for all, at last giving the fighters power over their careers and the true cut of the pie that they've been denied since the very beginning. It's something I have done on this very channel, depict these three actions as if MMA God will descend from MMA heaven and completely change the sport in an instant with a mighty bolt of retribution, a feel-good sentiment that the hopeful can latch onto. This idea that huge change is just around the corner, the wheels are in motion, the cogs are falling, the fighters will inevitably get what they truly deserve. It's just a matter of time. But to again quote Machiavelli, Men in general judge more from appearance than from reality. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and this is why MMA is broken and never getting fixed. Now, I know that title is harsh, and there's a considerable amount of nuance to discuss here. I am your big daddy, and I am gonna kiss the boo -boo. But I do think that by the time you finish this video, you will have a much different perception of the current state of mixed martial arts and where it's going in the future. Because the reality of these efforts, the reality of their potential success and the potential impact they could have, is more complicated and I would argue far less dramatic than most would expect and hope. So it's time for a strong dose of reality. But not from me, as I have often overshot what these efforts can and will do. Today, real experts will be speaking on all three topics about the realities of their success about the realities of their impact. John S. Nash, a journalist who has been studying, writing about, and discussing the ins and outs of the MMA business and finance more prolifically than just about anybody on the planet. When I reached out to a lawyer familiar with the combat sports world, who I thought would have been perfect to appear in this video, they told me I was better off getting Nash because he was far more equipped to discuss all three topics. Jason Cruz, a lawyer, not the one who told me to get Nash instead. Jason has been published in law journals specifically about combat 
Combat Sports and Antitrust. He's also the editor-in-chief of MMA Payout, a site dedicated to the business of mixed martial arts for over a decade. These two will be giving their expert opinions throughout the video as we discuss these three efforts and what they truly mean to the sport. So let's start with something that's already impacted the business of MMA a good deal, the antitrust lawsuits. The UFC is facing legal action from current and former MMA fighters, but what exactly is this lawsuit all about? The top 5% of the athletes in our sport make a pretty decent living. There's 95% of the athletes in our sport that are struggling to make a living. And the truth is fighters are not paid what they're worth in terms of market dictated value. It's not a monopoly. You do have choices, but there's one clear top of the food chain right. choice, but it's because they do it the best. Potentially, I think there could be like $4 billion worth of damages awarded. I mean, is that concerning? You at all with the Not even a little bit. It concerns me so much that I don't even know anything about it. One change always leaves the way open for the establishment of others. Niccolo Machiavelli. It's been over eight years since Kung Lee et al. filed their lawsuit against Zufa LLC. I guess the right to a speedy trial only counts in criminal cases. At current, the holdup is the eminent official written opinion of the plaintiff's class certification status by the presiding judge. You don't need to know what any of that really means besides the fact that it needs to happen in order for the trial to take place, but it will not be the last step before then. That'll be coming out soon. After that, we have 30 days for the, Uf the UFC's attorneys to submit an appeal to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, that's the question. Will the Ninth Circuit take up the appeal? I do think there is a strong case. I think the UFC, the Ninth Circuit will turn down that appeal because the appeal will be based on the class cert. Was it proper class cert? That'll be, that's the limit. That happens that in 2024, we'd be looking at a trial. Jason Cruz is not as bullish on a 2024 trial date. All we need to start the appeal process is a written opinion. At that point, it would go back down to the trial court for further litigation. So we're talking multiple years before we actually get to a point where a trial date will be set. We could be looking closer to the later 2020s for this to actually sniff a courtroom. All right, so after a string of appeals, it does look like the lawsuit could go forward sometime between 2024 and 2030. Delayed justice is still justice though, right? The fighters clearly have a case, so if this goes to trial, it's a slam dunk, isn't it? Well, not exactly. It really is dependent upon a lot of rulings that will go forward even before trial, a lot of pretrial litigation that, that occurs. Could the fighters prove their particular case regarding monopoly and monopsony? That will be up to Judge Bulware and what evidence he will rely on when it gets, gets to that particular point. At this particular point, if he grants class certification for the bout class of fighters, I would foresee a hard road to prove the actual damages that they're, they're claiming. I've spoken to several other lawyers and experts as well that feel that if this case did go all the way through trial to a ruling, the chances of the fighters winning aren't great. But not all is lost here. While Jason did explain to me in our conversation he fully expects Endeavor to move forward with a trial and take their chances, at some point if the risk becomes too too high, a settlement could be met to avoid any potential catastrophic results, and if the fighters won outright and got what they truly seek, the results would be catastrophic for the UFC. The $5 billion in treble damages aside, the fighters would likely be granted one to two year contracts at maximum with hosts of current provisions wiped out, a move that would completely change the power dynamic. So how close would we get to that in a settlement? I don't think they would be drastically more what they currently did. Let's say if they went to a three year maximum sunset provision instead of the four year, I mean five year or four year even. That is still a major difference. Four years is a long time, but it's not, a lot of fighters do end up, you know, they fight two years and then at that point you're like, well, I wanna sit out, I can sit out a year or two. That would be a massive victory for fighters. I do see them settling for probably hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, but think how big the UFC is now. Since they've waited this long in the case, that is not a existential threat to the UFC. That's not the end of the UFC. That's a portion of their EBITDA for one year. Let's say I'm just throwing out a number and I have no basis for what that number is going to be, but let's say they say it's, we're going to settle for $500 million. A few years ago, before Endeavor bought them, before they got an ESPN, that could have potentially crippled the UFC. Now it's like, well, you know, let's, we, we kind of lose our profits for one year. They settle it, the investors might be, take, they might take a slight hit, but the investors are now like, oh, it's settled, it's out of the way, we don't have to worry about this anymore. So at best, a settlement could likely see monetary compensation in the hundreds of millions, but remember, 
Remember, that number would be split across all UFC fighters over a seven-year period that qualify for class status. And some more potential contract concessions could be made, which could have a pretty big impact. At worst, the UFC crushes this lawsuit entirely in trial and nothing is gained. That's not entirely accurate, though. Even if the UFC did win and the fighters were given nothing, the fact that this has even happened has made an impact that often goes unappreciated. Kong Lee, Nate Corey, John Fitch, all those guys, they've actually accomplished stuff and they get basically no credit. They all often get mocked by fans for being disgruntled, but they're the guys that got the contracts to change. They're the guys that got a hearing in Congress that released all the information about their the UFC finances. So the talking point that everybody talks about, the UFC only pays 18, 17%. That didn't come from people like making it up or, or finding on their own. That came from those guys in Discovery. So they've done a ton of the work and they get none of the credit. Of course, the agonizingly slow turning wheels of the justice system are not the only hope for fighter equality. The Ali Act expansion for mixed martial arts could be passed into law in theory over the course of just a single day's time. Representative Mark Wayne Mullen has at least suggested the idea of extending the Ali Act protections to mixed martial arts. Is that something you'd support? Absolutely, and I've already heard that the martial arts people are inclined to support such a measure. Couture, a cage star turned Hollywood actor, says the Muhammad Ali Act can help. The Ali Act means that he can't keep 85% of the money, that other people are going to come in and bid for those fights, and he has to be in a competitive wage market. Fighters are getting about 15% of revenues. In major sports, it's 50%. The Ali Act would change that. They take all the merchandise, they take all the pay reviews, they take all the gate, keep all the money, and then they just, they give whatever they want to the fighter. Here's 100000 We think that's worthy, mm. even though they made $100 million. The one who adapts his policy to the times prospers, and likewise that the one whose policies clashes with the demands of the times does not, Niccolo Machiavelli. After I posted our recent video about the Ali Act and its potential impact, the excellent video you made, don't, don't knock yourself there. To my dismay, I saw a tweet from the very John S. Nash in this video. Greatly respecting his work, I immediately messaged him on Christmas Eve, Eve no less, and asked if he would jump on a call to discuss the topic. Not only did he do so, he gave me over an hour of his time, and it was that conversation that prompted the creation of this video as a follow-up. In my previous effort about what an Ali Act could do, I saw sweeping changes by the legislation, contracts nullified, new promotions popping up to make the market competitive, championships independent of the promotions, fighters taking control of the business, and the eventual slide into what boxing has become with four major sanctioning bodies and a mess of a sport. But there was one thing I hadn't considered well enough. Yeah, I mean, the Ali Act could, could, could conceivably radically change MMA as we know it. But the one thing that exists in MMA is the UFC. There's this 800 pound gorilla that has almost all the revenue coming through it. The UFC brand so strong, conceivably they add sales to the pay-per-views. So they could still pay a smaller percentage, but much more than they're currently and match whatever anybody else is paying because their brand is gonna add to the sales. Top fighters might make more now if they're free to leave to go to Showtime, PFL or Bellator, but the UFC could easily increase the amount of their pay fighters uh, to match or surpass with those other ones, even if they're getting millions now, and still pay a much lower percentage than those other promoters. They just have to pay a much higher percentage than they currently do. You wouldn't see this fracturing because the UFC could easily still outbid everybody. So even if the Ali Act was as far reaching as it conceivably could be, you would still have a promotion with tons of money that could basically outbid, outperform any other promotion. People think the whole sport would be completely collapsed, but you know, that we'd instantly be boxing. I do think if the, the big one is, do you separate the title from the promoter? And that's a big question because it's not clear in the Ali Act. It's just it kind of suggested under the idea that you can't have compensation from a promoter to a sanctioned organization. But you could make that clear in a new, uh, you know, a new expansion act. You made that clear and made that sure that the uh, clarify that the promoter cannot be uh, uh, have their own titles, have to use an outside independent sanction organization for titles. That's a huge impact because fighters now, the, you, a promoter can no longer use the leverage of saying you can only get a fight for the title if you sign with us. So if the wording of the Ali Act isn't exactly clear and the independent titles would actually make a huge impact, what changes did Senator Mark Wayne Mullen make to the original act when he introduced it in 2017 to expand into MMA? Well, 
uh, way he proposed it was just seemed so hastily made and uh, just cut and paste uh, revision of, of the boxing's all the act. It would have been more impressive if he were to put forth some sort of specifics regarding MMA. I don't foresee any impact at all from the uh, Ali Act expansion that was proposed by Senator Mark William Mullen. And I doubt if at all it would have any bearing on helping fighters health and safety. And moreover, I don't see any worth in uh, any legislative function as far as how that Ali Act expansion would go, it would be just a waste of time for any lawmaker to try to pass that thing. It's not it's not worth anything. It doesn't do anything for MMA fighters. I personally don't think that the uh, Ali Act for Boxing has helped boxers that, that much because promoters have found ways around the legislation. I think that the, uh, the Boxing's Ali Act needs to be refreshed, to be honest. All right, so the Ali Act has some problems, and as it currently exists, if it were to expand into MMA, would likely not see the sweeping changes expected by so many. There's another huge issue here, though. The act getting passed into federal law in the first place. Unlike boxing, I don't think there's a lot of people in Congress that are big fans of MMA. There's a handful. Boxing, there were a lot of Congress people that were fans of boxing, and they were aware of boxing. MMA still, I think, is viewed basically as a trash sport. It's just viewed as a freak show, human cockfighting type thing. So it doesn't get the attention, perhaps, that other sports would get, especially boxing coming off the heels of, you know, Ollie a few years before, and then Tyson did the whole Don King. So there was impetus back then for the bill to pass. So I think that'll be the hard part. Can you muster the support to get it to pass? And on top of that, you have this major entity endeavor with tons of money that will be lobbying against it. You would have to have a groundswell of partisan support from both uh, Democrats and Republicans on this particular bill. And if you just look at Congress right now, it's, it's a mess. And I don't foresee uh, both sides of the party supporting an MMA bill. You know, even then it would have to get to the Senate where it might have a little more traction because it would have gone through the House, but I just don't see it happening. We gotta remember when the uh, the, the first, not the Ali Act, the first bill, because the Ali Act is an amendment to the Professional Boxing Safety Act. That passed in 1996. The first bill ever proposed, submitted to Congress to help boxers was 1960. It took 36 years. If there's There is multiple bills. It wasn't like the Ali Act and the Professional Boxing Safety Act and then the Ali Act were introduced in their past, there was bill after bill after bill, Congress after Congress, that was submitted and never passed. So it took a long time. So it's interesting to follow because it's interesting to see how much attention it can get, how much support, and it's always conceivable it could pass, right? It's always conceivable that the tent, something could happen, the, the focus is on it and it passes, but I'm I'm of the opinion, I'm kind of wait and see. Let's wait and see how much attention it has, how much support it has. Well, that didn't sound promising at all, did it? And so, with the fate of the antitrust lawsuit still very much in limbo, and the likelihood of an Ali Act expansion not particularly great, what about the fighters taking control for themselves? Not on the hopes of a court ruling or of the government, but by their very own collective existence, by a fighters association. The problem is like, the company is so big, and they are getting bigger and fighters are getting smaller that everybody is scared. It's not a question of if it should happen, a union. It's a question of when it will happen. It will happen because it happened in boxing, it happened in, in basketball, in hockey. It's like we already don't have a lot of leverage, bro. Like we, you know, yeah. We, so, so, there's only so many things that, that we could even do. We're here to take every step necessary to make sure that no athletic, no no athlete, no fight in the UFC gets left behind. Just the healthcare and the and, and the pension and the what do we do next and the and the what do we need to do right now. That that's the part to me that that thing needs to be heard. I've been feeling like this for a long time, and I know that all the other fighters have too. Actually, it's just that uh, nobody wants to get on the bad side of the UFC. In the octagon, they're world class in defending themselves. Outside of the octagon, right now. They're, they're getting bullied and it's almost embarrassing. And something has to change and something has to change now. Men are so simple and so much inclined to obey immediate needs that a deceiver will never lack victims for his deceptions. Niccolo Machiavelli. I believe out of the three things we've talked about today, an association would benefit fighters the most simply because it is the easiest path 
path to getting what they want now. Fighters, they'll say off the record, maybe not on the record, but off the record, they'll say they want a union or an association, some sort of representation. I remember Chad Dundas did a, a survey of them. It was like 80%. And me talking to fighters, it's pretty clear that an overwhelming majority want it. So if a fighters association is the easiest route for fighters to take to get their fair share and the majority of fighters want it, why has this effort failed time and time again? Jeff Boris, the MMAAA, and most recently Project Spearhead. None of them have been able to get fighters collective bargaining rights. I attempted to get a hold of all the major players involved with Spearhead, but was unable to get any responses. Their last official tweet came in May of 2022, before that a whole two years back, and Leslie Smith, the interim president, has been inactive on social media for over a year. So what's the deal? Why hasn't this seemingly best option worked? The problem is, when you're an MMA fighter, your career might be two, three years at the point where you're at the top of the game and can make money. So any work stoppage, right? Any risk to your career, your momentum could be the end of any moment when you can make money or actually make a dent on the industry. And on top of that, there's nothing that says a fighter is one of the best fighters. Like we don't have independent sanction organizations. We don't, it's not boxing where the boxers own their rank. You know, the sanction organization put a rank, the boxer owns that rank. So they can, they carry that rank with them no matter what promoter they're with. If you're an MMA, the promoter can cut you. The promoter can bring in someone else to the UFC and those are now UFC fighters. You're no longer a UFC caliber fighter. There's nothing that limits the number of top fighters. It's all up to the promoter. Are you a top fighter or not? And so it's very risky for fighters to do anything. And if none of them will come out and speak about wanting to have an, an organization or organizing or solidarity or union or association, anything you want to do, well, then it just it, it has a chilling effect because everybody assumes none of the other fighters are willing to do it. The problem I see with fighters and an association in like the UFC is that you have a good sum of fighters that are happy with the promoter, that are making a lot, or at least are in the good graces of the promoter. And you got a middle class that wants to be the higher class, and then you got a lower class that is just happy to be there. So it's hard for someone who's getting what they want, like a Dustin Poirier or maybe a Conor McGregor or somebody of that magnitude, to go out out and say, you know, hey Dana, we want to be bargaining as a unit. And what that means is we want a higher percentage of the fight revenue. We want a percentage of the sponsorships that you're receiving. We want a bigger, better purses. We want better insurance, things of that nature. And Dana would probably come back and say, what? I've taken care of you throughout all this time, Dustin or Connor or whatever. Why would I concede these points when I've given you everything? And that is another problem with MMA. It's not like a team sport. It's not like you could be the San Francisco 49ers and say, hey, this is affecting all of us. And so even though fighters train together, it's not affecting one fighter when he goes in the ring and he wins, he gets 100 and 100 versus your training partner who starts in at eight and eight. All right, so at this point, you're probably thinking, wow, Tommy, this is depressing. The antitrust suit is probably going to fail. Congress is a mess and they don't care about MMA. And the fighters themselves have to look out for their own best interests. And it makes collective action incredibly difficult. Even if these things were to come through, as we've talked about today, we might see some small wins here and there, maybe some things change, but this sweeping wholesale fighter revolution that so many want just seems to be completely out of the cards. So I guess the title's right, MMA really is broken and is never getting fixed. But don't completely give up on the sport just yet. There's still possibilities, particularly if these actions compound their smaller successes into something bigger. The UFC has limited their contracts, and God Manu is a free agent now. Paulo Costa is going to wait out his contract because the UFC limited their contracts. So they could maybe do it, even cut it shorter. They could There could be more limitations put on the contract. That'd give fighters more ability to leave the promotions, the UFC, the UFC specifically in this case. But then, okay, let's say after that, they pass the Ali Act. Well, we have the Ali Act now. The promoters can't hold the leverage of the titles over us. The promoters can't use course of contracts. The promoters have to share their comps. That gives us more ability and on top of that. So I have I, my contract more limited because the, the antitrust lawsuit, the Ali Act says I have uh, my control of my own rank and title now because of its separation between the promoter and the sanction organization. And then it goes, okay, now we force an association. The association can enforce the Ali Act for us. And that gives us more power and more leverage. And, and then even, even going further, the association, we can say, we don't like the sanction organizations. We've organized an association that's strong enough. We're going to make our own sanctioning organization. We're going to get rid of the sanctioning organizations and our association is going to make its own title. The fight basically benefit from and control to make sure there's no corruption on that end. So that step by step, if you put them together, it becomes
becomes, then it becomes a drastically different world. It is certainly possible that victories in each of these three major efforts would compound, would have a sort of domino effect. And that's also not considering that other completely unrelated legislation or rulings could come around that drastically affect the business of fighting, like the proposed FTC ban on non-compete clauses. So it's not entirely bleak, but the point of today's video was to give the reality of the situation with the opinions of real experts on the topics. These are going to be incredibly difficult roads ahead, and there's no guarantee that any one of them will make the impact people hope for, or that any one of them will even succeed. There may not be a solution that ever comes to this problem, except of course the problem child himself, Jake Paul. The hope is that this video gave you a much better idea of the realities of the difficulties that face these efforts by fighters. The reality is it would take a lot of fighters willing to brave some serious heat, like Francis Ngannou, like Nate Diaz, like the antitrust suit plaintiffs, because as Machiavelli said, never was anything achieved without great danger. I'd like to, of course, give a huge thank you to John S. Nash and Jason Cruz for lending their expert opinions for this video, and thanks for checking this one out. I'll chat you all up later.